Um, so I just wanted to show a very last thing on GDB before the exercise. So, okay, let's just. So I break, I have the same script as before. A plus A, I broke at array underscore add. And if you remember, like array add took two array uh, object pointers, M1 and M2. So prem is M1 is just a, for GDB at that point is just a pointer. So that's a bit ugly. And actually, if, uh, we'll try to fix that during the sprint. It's a bit ugly, but still, if you know enough about the uh, NumPy data structure, you can do something. Um, so the issue is you're having a Python array object here. So M1 is the first argument of array add. My array in Python, that's a simple array of um, So I actually restarted GDB. Uh, I restarted the script. I have, instead of random, I have like non-value, one, two, three, four, and a float. Float, be careful in NumPy, it means double, double precision. So what I'm doing here, I have the M1 pointer here. Because of the new hiding I mentioned a bit before, you need to convert it to like a private structure that gives you back the implementation. And this is called pyre object underscore fields. So you convert the M1 pointer to pyre object underscore fields pointer. What this allows you to do is because a pyre object fields is a data structure that contains the data pointer, you can access the data. If I didn't have this section here, if I tried to call data on it using the C syntax, GDB would give me an error. Oh, pyre object doesn't have the data uh, attribute. The so data attribute, if you remember, there's a pointer to the actual data from my array. I know my array is an array of float because that's what I call in my script right here. Um, sorry, right here. So be careful, float is actually double precision. So I need to convert this pointer data to a double star. And then I look at the first item and I get one. I get two, I get three. So I actually get the actual content of my NumPy array in Python inside GDB inside the C code, I mean, inside the C runtime. So M1 was the first parameter of array add. So I can do it again, uh, like if I do. So I restarted the script. I broke at array add. M1 is the first parameter, and M2 is the second parameter. Here, because GDB doesn't know about NumPy, it can only tell you the address of the pointers, which is not that useful. But if you look at that, then you can look at the data. You could imagine looking at the dimensions, all these kind of things. So, well, it's still GDB, so it's a bit like 70s UI, but it can still be pretty useful to like look into um, for some of the things you want to do, it works can still works better than just using printf and. Is there <sighs> so on Linux, it depends on what you want to do. Um, Is there some way to avoid that? So yeah, in this you can have like. Actually, with the recent version of GDB, GDB seven, you have like a Python API around it, so you can kind of program GDB from Python. I still wouldn't expect it's very easy to do, but uh, at least it's easier than doing it in C. Um, so like better tool, it depends on what you want to do. Like to debug sometime, like typically like seg faults. On Linux, what works pretty well is Valgrind. So if I have time, but I may not, um, I will show a bit about Valgrind later. So Valgrind, it's basically a VM. You run your program unmodified. It runs much more slowly, but it will know, like for each pointers, it knows the way it was malloced. So when you have a seg fault, if you're in GDB, you know your pointer is seg faulted, but you don't really know where it's coming from generally. In Valgrind, it knows, it, because it's a VM, it knows all this information you don't know normally at runtime. 
And for debugging stack fault, this can be pretty useful. Question? I know you can, but I don't remember how, if someone knows. I, I know you can get a core dump, but I just don't remember. So. X? Oh. Uh, I guess it's data. Oh. Right, OK. Oh, you mean for the break syntax, or? No, no, to, to list, to list with you about the Yeah, I was just thinking, you didn't know all the passwords, and you know the entire data structure, then you had a rough idea of, mm -hmm. I don't want to be looking at it in a way Right. So yeah, in this, I, I don't know what to do. Um, you yeah, that look into. Yeah. So what should be pretty easy to do actually is some GDB macros that understand about NumPy arrays. Do so you have like pretty printing? This should be pretty easy. Like recent version of GDB, they have pretty printing for Python. Like if you have like like the integer representation, implementation in Python, or like double, this is pretty printed because GDB knows about it. I don't think it would be a lot of work to do the same for NumPy arrays, actually. OK. So we just to go back a bit, um, really the main point here is understanding how you get from Python to C layer. That's really like one of the main difficulty when you, when you try to understand NumPy. And one of the main entry points is this Py array type data structure. That's what defines most of the functions that are called between Python and C. So this, I mean, that's just explaining what I just did before. Um, you create an array. Because you know that plus is a number protocol, then you know with what I explained is array add, then we can break in GDB and do this kind of thing. Oh, uh, one of the questions, I'm not a Windows developer, but uh, the, the Python plugin for Microsoft Studio, Visual Studio, actually does have mixed mode debugging across across the language area mm -hmm. that looks very slick. Um, I haven't used it myself, but, but uh, it's something that they've added recently that looks pretty, in, pretty impressive. Yeah, if it's the same for me, I've never used Visual Studio, so. So I will, I will actually bypass this. Um, I will explain later if you have time. This is the same, that's what, like pyre desk type is to like d type what the pi array type is to pi array object. So if it's again a single term, for each kind of d type you have only one data structure like this in memory, and then defines the behavior of data type. So for example, when you have like um, structured d type, where you have like multiple atomic types inside your d type, <coughs> well you still use the sequence protocol. So you need a sequence protocol uh, inside the D type. Same for mapping. And then most of the meat of the implementation of D type is in those um, uh, array of function pointers. And you have one of these for each kind of D type. So floating point D type, you will have one such thing. You have an instance of this thing. For an integer D type, you will have an instance of this thing. But I will kind of skip that over um, for now. So, okay, you know that A plus A is going to array add because I just explained it to you, but I, I would be lying if I said it was always that easy. Um, 
And again, you don't have a very good tool to do better on Linux in a way which is user friendly. So here, I have like a very hackish thing, which is just good enough to be useful somehow. So that's Linux specific, it doesn't work on Mac. So on Linux you have a, a tool called Perf. So we're not going into the details of Perf. So it's very user unfriendly because it's developed by kernel hackers, so like, it's, like you need to be a Vulkan to understand the manual, but and the thing that is useful is it gives you an API on top of the hardware content of your CPU. Like modern CPU have a lot of like different low level counters. Like every time they have a new instruction, the counter is updated. And you can have like very low level instruction uh, information like how many cache miss you have, how many page folds you have, all these kind of things. But you can have higher level information. In particular with modern kernel, uh, with a perf tool, you can actually get call trace at runtime. The problem is it's like statistical sampling. So that's why it's hackish. So here I have a small script that I will explain later. I have a small context manager. So the hackish part is I basically have an infinite loop here. I run this under the under perf um, um, context manager. And I do some operation here. Because I have an infinite loop, well, at some point you need to control C. But the idea is, hopefully at some point, with enough like samples, you will get somehow accurate call trace. And it gives you some idea of what's going on. Uh, oops. So we really don't have time to look into perf. Um, just knowing it exists, it's actually not that many people know about it. Just knowing it exists and that you can do this kind of thing, hopefully is useful. And here I get some kind of call trace. So I can see that what I, so actually if it's this um, record is for some of the script. I wanted to like profile and get an idea of indexing in uh, Python. So here you have a call trace, like 50, around 50% 50 of the time, is taken in this thing, and this is the call stack. Sorry, not call trace, call stack. So main, okay, it's your main function in Python when Python starts. You get all the call stack, and you know at the point, okay, if you didn't know how the indexing works, well, here you have a pretty good idea. A lot of time we're taken into the double fast take, and it gives you like the time taken in fast take. So, if it doesn't quite explain. So this script is including the USB key. Um, and you can see that the under path context manager is very, very simple. It's just four lines Python script. And the thing I do is, again, it's very stupid. What I do is, inside my while true, inside the context manager, I just call perf record. I sample like at one kilohertz, and I give the PID of the running process. So it's very hacky. So just like I say all the time, like kind of try to record some samples, the call stack. Um, at that point, if you do that enough, hopefully at some point you have some kind of decent call stack, and you get an idea of which function. I we use another example to do something very similar under call green. When when you do that, you need to call your function with the val green tool. So cal green is something inside val green. Because I'm late, I don't have time to go into that. But the code is here, so if you want to look at it, you can see how it works. And with cal green, it's much slower because it runs under val green. But because it's not statistical sampling, it will give you more accurate information. In the future, there is hope that perf actually will give you very accurate information because the recent kernel have like a user space probe information where you can probe at any time you want. It's like Detroit, basically. And you can get, there's no statistical sampling going on anymore. You can just say, I want to sample, I want to probe every time that function is called. And you can do that with a recent version of the kernel. But you need a kernel that is not released yet to do that. So maybe in a couple of years, it will be more reliable. OK. so. Python 
trace is because it can't look into the the extension model. Yeah. Like what you would like, I mean, the, the perfect UI would be you have, you run your script, you say, and what you would like to do is forget about all this stuff. You have A plus A, you want to put a breakpoint here, and then you can say next, 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 and oh, if you're going to C, then going to C. That's what the tool you would like to do. But this tool doesn't exist at this point. So what Fernando mentioned with like mix mode C, Python mode in Visual Studio, well, that's exactly what they managed to do, these two things. Like, Technically, it's just a lot of work, but it's possible. It's just nobody did that work on Linux. So, so instead, you have to use this kind of hack, or to work from first principle using what I showed before, like depending on which way you prefer. OK. So before giving back um, the mic to Stefan, there's a small exercise, which is actually a useful one. There is a NumPy bug here. It's still a bug in NumPy today. And uh, what about this exercise is I ask you to fix it. Because I know the bug is pretty easy to fix. But, um, so basically the idea is it's a perfect bug because, well, first, I tell you that it's easy to fix. And you have a script to reproduce it. So, and you cannot get better than that. Well, you have to go into C. Right? So it's not like 90% easy. So you have this small script here. If you want to script with the most recent version of NumPy, it will give you a bug. And the bug is from ETA is just an, a function to create a NumPy array from an iterator. And basically, the extension is swallowed. So you get an exception when you call from ETA, but that's not this exception. So basically, by, so the goal of the exercise is to fix that, to fix that bug. And basically, like, you need first to find out where is the C Python layering happening? And if you can do that already, it's pretty good. Then fixing the bug is actually pretty simple. Like the function that implements the iteration is pretty simple. And if you're really good, you can even fix it. So you can fix your problem. So I give you like maybe 10 minutes to try to find out how the function is called here. And um, and then I would just give the solution. Because otherwise, Stefan will have no time to do this part of the talk. <coughs> the first thing, just make sure you build NumPy, and then when you run the script, you get indeed a failure. Which is not, we'd expect this to fail anyway, but you would expect it to fail with this exception. And if you try it, you see, you get a different exception. You have a bit more description in the original. 